1,000 the better stories. Welcome to 1,000 Better Stories, the Scottish Communities Climate Action Network's podcast sharing stories of community-led climate action in Scotland to help us all imagine a better and fairer future beyond the new normal and transform what we think is possible. Hi, I'm Katie Ravel. I'm a podcast producer, I'm part of SCAN's Storytelling Circle, and I'm delighted to be guest hosting this episode of 1000 Better Stories. Thank you, Kashka, for the invite. In this episode, I'm going to be sharing some short podcasts I made earlier this year as part of a project called Soil and Soul. Soil and Soul was a collaboration between the British Society of Soil Science, a Glasgow-based group of artists called Open Jar Collective, and Propagate. Propagate are a worker-led collective focused on local, community and sustainable food projects. And support for the project came from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Soil and Soul was all about giving people the chance to explore soil, to learn about it and to engage with it in ways they'd maybe never done before. Members of Propagate led a series of workshops across Glasgow at after-school clubs, community gardens, a primary school, a college and a centre for women who are experiencing homelessness. During the workshops, the participants learned simple soil testing techniques. They built composters and wormeries, they created art from plants, and they shared their thoughts and feelings about soil. The Soil and Soul project took place in the run-up to the World Congress of Soil Science, which was held in Glasgow in August. It's a huge international conference that brings together thousands of soil scientists from around the world. And in fact, another key goal of Soil and Soul was to highlight to the delegates, to the soil scientists, industry members and policymakers at the conference, that ordinary people care really deeply about soil as well, if they're given the chance. As part of Open Jar Collective, I made nine short podcasts explaining the project and capturing the experiences of the different Soil and Soul groups. I'm going to share three of those podcasts with you just now. Let's start with a bit of background about the Soil and Soul project. One to soil, one to soil. Soil is. Soil is not dirt. Soil is. Soil is where the worms live. Soil is. Soil is everything. Soil and soul. What is Soil and Soul? Soil and Soul is about connecting people across Glasgow with soil in a meaningful way. I'm Lucy Cunningham and I work for Propagate Scotland. There's going to be a great big conference, a world conference on soil science this year in Glasgow. So we are helping to connect people with the soil that they work with in order to highlight its importance. Often it's only put across in a very scientific way, so people don't really understand how vital it is for life on Earth. The Congress is run every four years, and it's like applying to host the Olympics. I'm Willie, Willie Towers. I'm a former member of staff at the James Hutton Institute in Aberdeen. I worked there all my career, actually. I've also been a member of the British Society of Soil Science for even longer than that. The British Society are actually the hosts of the World Congress of Soil Science in Glasgow this coming August. And I'm part of the working group of taking forward that Congress. Essentially, the Congress is a scientific Congress, and it is the main soil science Congress globally. I've always had an interest in the outreach of soils to the wider community. Soil and Soul is the one external project I was really, really keen to get funded. We had a connection through a group called Open Jar Collective in Glasgow. We're an arts organisation that look at the world through the lens of food. I'm Alex Wild. I'm a member of the Open Jar Collective. We are interested in how food grows, food systems, and how we come together around food in terms of cultural exchange and community. 
and Alex, she came to the Institute up in Aberdeen eight or nine years ago. And that really opened my eyes as to what community involvement really was. To my shame, I'd never thought of that before. <laughs> but I thought, no, we really must get this up and running for the Congress in 2022. The Soil and Soul project kind of emerged after a, a series of different kind of smaller projects that we did over a number of years around what the soil is, what it does and why it matters. And yeah, we wanted to kind of do something around, you know, all the fantastic things that are happening in Scotland around soil. What is this matter, this stuff of soil? You know, why do we care about it? Why should we care about it? How do we steward it? And yeah, if there was a way to kind of celebrate that community focus on soil alongside the Congress. Alex put us in touch with another group in Glasgow, Propagate. I'm Susan Amane and I am part of Propagate Scotland. Propagate Scotland is a community interest company and we are a non-hierarchical collective of freelancers. Whilst nobody in Propagate is, technically speaking, a soil expert in the sense of being scientifically qualified, we work at, I think, the interface between people and soil. Open Jar Collective members have worked alongside Propagate members for a number of years, so we were really excited about the idea of doing something together and bringing together some of our you know, practical knowledge, our massive enthusiasm about soil and connecting that kind of creative look at how we frame soil with some of the kind of practical investigations with groups about the nature of soil and how it might differ in different parts of the city. I think that what this project aims to do is highlight to the soil scientists the importance of involving actual people in debates and issues regarding soil because soil is so fundamental to human health and human life and society. But also, hopefully, it will have the other effect of explaining the importance of soil to to lay people to people who would not often be in any way directly involved in soil even to the extent that they may literally never have touched soil before you know and particularly in an urban context i think that's quite important willie had talked to us about his ambition for the congress to be reaching out to the wider community and to understand kind of what was happening at a local level and bring the conversations of people that perhaps would have no knowledge of the Congress or it be inaccessible to them to bring their voices into that more kind of academic, scientific sphere and see if that was a way to spark a conversation, sharing knowledge, whether that was kind of scientific experts or people who are expert in their own communities. This is actually something quite unique in the history of World Congresses this outreach community aspect of people producing their own food within the city, the host city for the Congress. What we're doing here is taking the Congress out to the public. I'm really quite excited about it. Getting people's hands in the soil, getting them to respond and react, give us their kind of emotional responses also. I'm Mary. I'm part of the Propagate team that we're delivering the Soil and Soul project. It's just been a really interesting project. There was a general outline of wanting to engage with different groups from across the city. Each of us that was involved in the project then kind of reached out to the community to find out who would really want to take part. So we're working with groups who already garden to help them to understand about soil and to work with it. We're creating artworks using soil and we're also just looking into the kind of minutiae of how it works and what is important about it. For most of my career, I felt that soil was a forgotten part of the environment. It's mostly out of sight, out of mind. Unless you see a ploughed field, the soil is actually literally hidden. But when you consider 90% of the world's food comes from the land and only 10% comes from the sea, you know, it's, it's a key part of survival, actually. I think from a very basic and fundamental perspective, our soils are degrading and everyone will suffer as a result of this. So we need to foster a culture of understanding of the importance of soil. I think that's one thing. But I think on the other side of it, I think from a psychological perspective, people are missing out because for 
the vast majority of human history, we have been intimately connected to the non-human environment. You know, humans have been very much a part of the wider environment. And I think in the last few centuries, people have become more and more divorced from the non-human and I don't think that this is good for us fundamentally. I think that the more divorced people are from the non-human, the more we can live in a bubble in which we don't have to care about the wider environment. But also, I just don't think it's good for people. I think people feel better when they are living more as our ancestors would have lived. You know, I, I mean, we have evolved to live that way. And I think that a lot of the kind of physical and mental health issues that people face could in many ways be tied to the way we're living now and we can maybe try and mitigate that slightly. My career was very much in rural Scotland, working with the farming community or estates or crofters. I never worked in the urban environment or with urban communities. So I'm in a steep learning curve as to what the groups within the project are actually going to come up with. Soil is... Soil is where life comes from. Soil smells good after the rain. Soil is a good example of how you should live your life. You have to take in the bad stuff in order to have the good stuff. Next, let's visit Woodside Community Garden to hear from the kids there about their interactions with soil. I played with the sandcastle. I made um, bird bird houses. And I made I uh, planted uh, pumpkins. Pumpkins? And I forgot what else. That sounds like a lot. Yeah. What was your favorite out of those? Uh, planting. Uh, painting the Soil is... Soil comes in lots of different colours. Soil is... Soil is that dirty matter which is essential to life. Soil Soil is... is Soil is a magical living web. Soil and soul. Woodside Community Garden, just north of Glasgow city centre. A fenced garden with raised beds and planters. And Andy, look what I found. A frog! Grab it, Maria, grab it. Grab it and send it on vacation. Okay. What are you going to do with it? We need to throw it out so it doesn't eat our plant. It takes about two weeks to walk back into the garden. <laughs> what can I tell you about the garden? It opened nine years ago and I was the first grower and I am not entirely alone been responsible for uh, turning it from uh, a red ash uh, football pitch slash dog toilet into a garden, mostly by uh, shoveling tons and tons of wood chip over everything, which uh, has attracted a lot of insects, which has attracted a lot of birds, which has, in my mind, turned it into a garden. And we also grow things, so that's nice. Woodside Community Garden is a former sports pitch in the G20 area of Glasgow. So that's north and slightly west of the city centre. It's close to an area that many people would know as Mary Hill, but I think Queen's Cross is technically the name of the area. I'm Susan Amane and I am part of Propagate Scotland. And we have been working on the Soil and Soil project. The garden is actually primarily the responsibility of Queen's Cross Housing Association who run the two tower blocks on either side of it but it was actually designed some years ago by my colleague Abby who's part of Propagate with help and engagement from the local community and from the housing association. The garden itself is sandwiched between two enormous high rises. It's stunning in a way because it's it's such an unexpected thing to have between these high rises, these very colourful, very sort of technological looking high rises and then in the middle there's this little rustic patch it's on a very human scale you know and I think it's a little outlet in the area you know or it can be for the people that come into it we just dug up a bit and then we and then we found them in like this um wooden log what are Some they're teeny tiny up. little snails it's like they look like they're just newborn <laughs> and they don't even feel like it's on your hand when you feel it 
It feels like it's just like a leaf touching your finger. <laughs> Do you like them? Yes, I love them. My favorite thing about snails is that they listen to you. Good job. They don't like run off like um, dogs or anything. They just stay. And now this one's trying to poop on my hand. <laughs> there are roughly 47 different plants growing here, plus unidentified weeds. Um, a small orchard, apples and plums and one ornamental cherry. A pond made out of a bathtub from one of these buildings. Big black tubs for growing courgettes in, which are made out of water tanks from these buildings. A lot of uh, concrete rubble that came from these buildings. A lot of this garden is built out of things that would have been thrown away from these buildings. The interesting thing about that garden, from my perspective, is because I've come into that garden long after it's been established, what I'm seeing there is the soil in the raised beds and the soil in the various planters. And that has largely been soil that's been brought in, in, in either in bags or it's been the compost that has been made on site. What is actually on the ground itself, I have never actually really seen. I was going to say like the native soil, but it won't even be because it's all been put on top of an old sports pitch. So I don't even know how deep the soil goes. I've been working with a group of 5 to 11 year olds on the site. Queen's Cross Housing Association had a pocket of funding available for various community projects. Various organisations submitted proposals and it went to a local vote. And luckily, ours was one of the ones that was picked. So our project has been a collaboration between Propagate Scotland and Frog Life. Frog Life are primarily an amphibian charity, but in actual fact, they work with any kind of wildlife and habitat project. We've got a ladybird eating an aphid. Oh, wow. Listen, where is it? There's a ladybug eating a aphid. We found a ladybird and it's and eating aphids. Can you see it with the magnifying yeah, glass? Yeah. Wow. Do you see it? Do you see it? Yeah, it's right there. It's eating the, like, what's the name of this aphid? Yeah, the aphid. It's like a oh. little green fly. So maybe you see the I've never seen things. a ladybug eat before. I didn't even know ladybugs ate that kind of stuff. So the group started out as being an after-school club and it was open to anyone who lives in that area. They're really great. They're so enthusiastic and it's a very diverse group. Most of them speak different languages at home, like two or three languages in some cases, and the energy that seems to be generated by this group is like more than I've normally come across in most groups. It's lovely. Although sometimes completely overwhelming because like they're all talking to you at once. So the idea behind what we've been doing is that Frog Life would talk to them about habitats and wildlife and so on and I would do gardening with them. So that's largely how we've kind of progressed, although we were also doing things like crafts and painting and just games, anything that they want to do in the garden. It's just fun outdoor activities most of the time we didn't really have very set activities and I think that's lent itself very well to the soil project because anything that you do in a garden is in some way related to soil you were helping me plant vegetables the other week weren't you yeah. oh yeah can you remember any types um cabbage spinach on no. we did plant some onions a couple of weeks ago did you help with that too I think yeah, you did. I did. yeah 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 and we planted radishes, didn't we? Oh, yeah. And uh, lots of different salad things. Yeah. And we picked all the brassicas as well, didn't we? Do you remember they were covered in aphids? Oh, yeah. It was just a question of being in the garden and seeing what they wanted to do and just interacting with them in a positive way outside, you know? And because they were mainly coming straight from school, I think that was quite beneficial because it was like a bit of a break after being cooped up in a classroom and they were just kind of run around and let steam a bit, really. I think for a lot of them, it's one of the only places where they're not kind of policed and overseen. Although there are adults here, I think they're given quite free reign of what they want to do, and I've watched them get incredibly into soil sifting and, uh, you know, like, looking through for worms and finding wee beasties and stuff, and it's nice to have 
that space I think to explore. Hi, I'm Kit and I'm a sessional youth worker with Queen's Cross Housing Association. Hello! <laughs> yeah, I grew up in the countryside, so I think being in nature has always been a big thing for me. And I think for a lot of the kids here, they don't have spaces with gardens. These high rises and stuff, they don't have access to watching things grow. So yeah, we've done lots of things. We've grown vegetables, we've planted potatoes. The best thing of planting is you get to see the plants and how it grows. And all the creatures and insects and things like that. And how did it feel when you were planting to be touching the soil? What was that like? Weird. <laughs> Weird, funky and gooey. I never expect, expected that I would feel like that. And it's really interesting because I tend to find that when you work with kids whose families have lived in Scotland for generations, you often find that by this point there's very little concept of where food comes from at all or how it grows. I've worked with kids who have never seen a potato come out the soil. They didn't know it came out the soil. And with this group, I found less of that. I think with kids who you know, are only one, two generations removed from living much more rurally, that there is still a much greater cultural knowledge surrounding food production and we would find that a lot of the kids their parents would be growing stuff on balconies and things in a way that we often don't find with other groups so in a way that's quite nice because you're not having to start quite so much from absolute basics I think that also helps the enthusiasm levels because we would always be having kids asking to plant seeds and then take the seeds that they've planted really home growing but my potatoes are growing, it's the tallest so far. And I want it to make the fattest potato ever alive. <laughs> Everybody's got to be jealous. <laughs> what is it you like about growing food? Well, you get to see the, like, the changes and like what it looked like before. And um, at the end you get to eat it and put it in your soup or something. So, yeah. I'm making onions too. I, I'm going to bring it home to, to use it to make onion soup. Is there anything else in the garden that you like to eat? So um, there's this orange um, edible flower. I like it because it makes good um, perfume, but it also tastes good and you can eat the perfume because like it's edible. So, yeah. Is this your favourite thing to do in the garden? Yeah, You're growing. I like yeah. planting. I even made a plant. Um, I think it's green beans or something. Um, and it's still growing. It's very bushy though. It has so much leaves. So. They're very fearless, these guys. They like eat very underripe gooseberries as a challenge. They pick all the wee apples and who can eat the sourest so they have no fear um, they found that thyme flowers numb your tongue and then they went round and seen who could have the numbest tongue for the longest I think it's a way of like playing and experimenting with the world round about them in a pretty safe way um, it lets them kind of yeah, be free in a space not a folk telling them no you can't touch that you can't do that you shouldn't eat that you shouldn't it's just yeah a space to get better acquainted I think with the world round about them can you guys tell me what you're going to do now? We're going to pull these seed bombs out the gate. What do you think will happen then in a few weeks' time? It will grow a flower because um, there's seed inside. So this is an area that's getting redeveloped at some point, but whilst nothing really is happening here, it's just accumulating rubbish and we're going to throw some wildflower seeds here, so at least it'll be good for the bees. Are we all ready to start throwing? Okay, has everyone got one? Shall we throw it all together? Okay, one, two, three, go! Yeah! I guess I would just say give it a go with kids. I think that's my big takeaway from working with young people is they're so much more receptive than folk give them credit for. I think if you on paper say, thank you very much, Anzio, <laughs> um, if you say, you know, this will be our most popular club, which it is. You know, we have to turn folk away at the gates, which feels absolutely horrible, but we can only have a certain number of folk in the garden. And I think if you were to put on paper, like, oh, kids can come and learn a bit about gardening, you wouldn't expect that to be the biggest attractor of all the stuff that we do when we have, like, animation workshops and homework that they have to do for school and on some of them they get dinner at and stuff, but 
consistently everybody comes to gardening. Communities want to be involved, you know. Folk know that we're at a point at the moment that feels like we're on the precipice of something and we want ways to be better acquainted with the world around about us. And the natural world does that, soil does that, gardening does that. So give everyone a chance, I guess. <laughs> Is there anything you haven't grown before that you'd like to try and grow? Um, I would like to grow um, tomatoes because I've never grown tomatoes. And I want to, uh, like, there's different types of tomatoes, so I want to experience it. Have you been doing anything with the soil to help the plants grow? Yes, so, like, with my potatoes, every time it turns taller, we put more earth in, inside of it. Like, it's another word for soil. Uh, we put more earth on top of it, but, like, oh, not all the way up to the plant, so it can still grow. And then every time it gets taller and taller, we put more earth so it can grow, because that's how you grow potatoes. I saw you have a compost bin over yeah. there. So do you guys do composting as well? Yes, we get it and put it on that green thing, and then we mix it, and then it turns very soft and um, soily, if that's even a word. And then um, we use it to plant stuff, and some people are also making seed bombs out of the soil. So it's very helpful. And what do you think makes good soil? Soil is basically a uh, worm's poop. But like, if some people think it sounds disgusting, but I don't really think so. It's but good, it's part it's good of nature. Stuff. Exactly. And nature is good. <laughs> and well it's full. Absolutely. There's just something so humbling, I think, in a time where you're overwhelmed by the world round about you and every day the news tells you horrible things are happening um, there's something so lovely about knowing that you're a tiny part of the bigger world around you and I think gardens and soil do that for me, I think putting my hands in the ground and remembering that I'm part of that world round about me and that at the end of the day I'm quite insignificant and one day I will be soil <laughs> is quite a useful feeling sometimes, I think. I think a lot of the time you're stressed out that you're maybe not doing enough for the world. Um, and I think by planting, even if it's just, I have a rosemary bush now, so anything that I need rosemary for, I know that I made this from nothing. It's quite comforting, I think, just to, yeah, reconnect with the world and have these kind of like micro wins in a world that's so focused on the huge bigger picture I think Can I just... Hi guys, do you miss me? No, nobody missed you <laughs> For the people who are going to be listening to this can you just describe what you're looking at and what you're showing me So, um very curly bumpy uh, green thing um kind of bitter when you taste it but like not that bitter and it's soft and it's very very bright it's brighter than everything um next to it and what is it lettuce <laughs> soil is soil is the nicest thing i've smelled all week soil is or you know uh, good for plants to so you can uh, go uh, plant it I would say soil is hope. It's believing that the world is worth investing in and it's believing that lovely things can come from nothing. There's a quote in a book that I read recently that said, even if I knew the world was going to go to hell tomorrow, I would still plant an apple tree today. And that's going to be my next tattoo. <laughs> And finally, let's hear from members of the Soil and Soul team as they explain why they care about soil and why they're so passionate about helping other people to access it, learn about it and advocate for it. Why do we care about soil? I grew up you know, in classic council house estates. There wasn't much 
garden space and there wasn't much ways that children could directly engage with their environment. And some of the green spaces that were around were very much like no children allowed, no ball games. You know, there wasn't much opportunity for children to get their hands in their soil, to be able to dig even, just dig for worms. So I'm really passionate about children being able to have that engagement with their environment in a way that, you know, some other children grew up in a very lovely place where they have a garden and it's a private garden and they have that experience. But a lot of inner city kids, yeah, really miss out on that engagement. So that's a big driving force behind a lot of the things that I do is to be able to give children just that opportunity to even just very simply get their hands in the soil and feel what that is. I grew up in Liverpool, so, well, just outside of Liverpool, so in like a kind of commuter town suburb thing. And my mum just always gardened. And to me, it just seems completely normal. I can't imagine having a garden and not trying to grow stuff in it. I just feel so much more relaxed if I'm working in a garden. I just think it's that combination of kind of gentle exercise, seeing some tangible results from what you're doing, being outside in the fresh air and not sitting at a computer staring at it the whole time. It's just so much nicer than most of the things that we do in modern life. I've always had an interest in soil, I think. As a kid, my parents had an allotment. I'd love to go along and just get my hands in the soil and and grow things. I've got an allotment as an adult and uh, I share my enthusiasm with my son about the allotment and we both really enjoy digging in the compost bin and finding the best bits of soil and we like calling it black gold. It's really nice, it's got lots of vitamins for the plants and luscious things, not for us but for the plants. We like the smell of it too don't we, picking up a big handful of it and when it's nicely kind of rotted down because it's got a good smell to it. Kind of like lots of food. Kind of like like old plants. And sometimes it feels a bit like old memories. You've got to touch soil. I do worry that a lot of uh, well, scientists and some farmers now actually don't touch the soil. They drive around in their big tractors with GPS systems and they've got their headphones on, listening to music. They don't actually touch the soil. And you can actually learn a lot by touching the soil through its texture, how much sand is in it, how much clay is in it, its soil structure. It's the more intrinsic properties of the soil, how it looks, how it feels. That's what gets me going. (laughs) When you take soil samples with a core, it takes you back to earth. (laughs) It takes you down to earth. It's alive. I'd like people to know that it's alive and it should be revered as such because you can mistreat it and you can kill it. You can actually kill it. It doesn't need kid gloves or anything. It can take a lot, but it is alive and it's organisms which depend on each other and in order to keep it healthy, it needs to do what nature would do for it, which is feed it. And not just feed it water, but it would get nutrients. So if you've got soil stuff growing, It wouldn't be bare. In nature, soil would never be bare. So you need to be adding compost and mulch and uh, nutrition that's not chemical in order to keep it healthy and keep those worms procreating and moving through your soil. (laughs) A colleague of mine developed a really nice trick we took to various shows and public events where we had five different soils. You put a tube into the soils and it runs through what's called a respirometer, and you get a signal on the computer which shows the soil actually breathing. You give it to a small child who blows into the same tube, and you get the same signal. Honestly, the, the look on the child's face was absolutely brilliant. And yeah, that's a very simple message that soils breathe. You know, a poor soil doesn't breathe very well. <laughs> and soils can die. So, yeah, soils breathe. I think people would benefit from knowing more about how to treat their soil, but they don't really think about it, you know. And if you go to your average garden centre, you get treatments for sale, 
and they're not always very good for general plant health or biodiversity so I would like to see an educational programme like this one widened in scope and rolled out across the world if they wouldn't mind doing that that would be good yeah <laughs> I'll pass it on okay yep. if I was going to pass on a message to the soil scientists I would ask them to please focus on working on projects that will enable normal people to live better rather than focusing on the interests of big agricultural big business and I think one of the ways in which they could do that would be to focus as much as possible on urban environments and urban soils such that people can make better use of them in terms particularly of sustainable food production but also I think that they should be aware if they're not already of land rights and ownership rights and that improving the soil or stopping the degradation of soil needs to be linked to more equal access to and fairer use of the soil and the land and I realise that a scientist can't necessarily entirely change that but I think that this is something that they need to campaign for as well. I suppose it's about acknowledging our cultural relationships to soil and the importance of that in thinking about how we protect and steward it. I suppose I'm asking that that is a valued part of the conversation because soil has so much to it and in it that's not just about the science of it it's about our relationship to it and that yeah is so important in how we're going to think about remediating it nurturing it stewarding it and protecting it in the future soil is okay uh soil is alive soil is life I know that is probably an oft-repeated phrase and I'm sure that comes to many people's mind, but it is so teeming with life. It is so essential to life. Soil brings life. <laughs> That's so cheesy. That's so true, That's so true though. <laughs> I'm just going to have to say again, soil is alive. Yeah, soil is alive. But is it well? <laughs> If you ask 10 soil scientists what is soil, you get 11 different answers <laughs> of varying complexity and uh, depth. I'll offer two, and none of them are particularly technical. Soil essentially is a mixture of mineral material, organic material, water, and air. And depending on the balance between those four components, you will have a range of different soils. For example, the peatlands of northern Scotland which are very, very important in terms of biodiversity, water storage, and in the climate change agenda, storing carbon. It's actually 90% water. A functioning bog is 90% water. And it needs to be 90% water to function properly, to capture the carbon through the sphagnum moss that's on its surface. So you can compare that to, say, a, a soil in East Lothian, which is only about 2.5% carbon. Peat is 57% carbon. It's a very simple way of putting the four components, but it's the proportions of each of those components which create a different soil. And another definition, well, it's not really a definition, it's a description. It's the very narrow living surface between air and bedrock upon which civilizations depend. Soil is... Soil is a precious resource between rock and air. Soil, for me, is where all life starts and all life ends. Soil is hope. It's believing that the world is worth investing in. If you'd like to hear the rest of the Soil and Soul podcasts, you can find them at propagate.org.uk forward slash soil dash and dash soul or by searching for Open Jar Collective on Spotify, Google Podcasts or SoundCloud. 
The podcasts are also available on a platform called Easy Travel, where you can see a map of the different groups and their locations. Visit iazi.travel and search for Soil and Soul. A huge thank you to everyone who is involved and to Blue Dot Sessions for the music. And thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like and maybe even a review. It will really help us reach a wider audience. If something exciting is happening in your own community, be sure to let us know so that we can help you tell your own story. Or maybe you would like to join our brand new storyteller collective. You can drop our story weavers a line at stories at scottishcommunitiescan.org.uk. To keep up to date, check out our website at scottishcommunities.org.uk or find us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram or simply sign up to the newsletter.